Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelic Today. Joe Moore here with Michelle Janikian. Um, Kyle Buller should join us in a little while, but let's get started. So uh, before we jump too deep into the news, just a reminder that we do have more rounds of Navigating Psychedelics coming up. If you are a therapist and you want to be able to speak to your clients about psychedelics, this is the course you want to take. We teach you how to navigate all this fun stuff and much more. Um, we've had doctors, therapists, psychologists from around the world join us. I think over 20 countries at this point, and we're just um, endlessly excited about the course. So learn more over at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And uh, if you have any questions, hit us up, support at psychedelicstudy.com. Um, I think that's it. We might have some things coming up, um, but let's just get into it, Michelle. So Michelle, with your help, we were able to put out a whole mess of material on um, in, in and around Memorial Day. We didn't release anything specifically on Memorial Day, but we had a really cool blog and then a, a podcast, right? Was there yeah, anything we, else we did? We had two really cool blogs and oh, a podcast. Yeah. yeah, so last week we put out... Um, an article by a vet, like a, we often don't do this, but we put out like a first person narrative of, you know, a healing psychedelic experience, which is in a new series we are calling Healing Trip Tales, basically because I couldn't think of anything more clever. <laughs> but um, so we have, um, yeah, a former Navy SEAL, I think, um, wrote, he wants to rename anonymous, so I'm trying not to say his first name, <laughs> um, a really fascinating story that um, was sponsored by the organization Vets, which works with veterans to support helping them fund um, psychedelic retreats. And he went to Mexico to an Ibogaine clinic and um, did Ibogaine, followed by 5-MAO-DMT, and not exactly for addiction, but for PTSD and traumatic brain injury. So it's kind of a little different, which is why we wanted to publish it. And his point of view is just really like, oh, really fascinating, really relatable. He's all like, I don't know about all this hippie stuff, but this was real. I swear I like went to the spiritual realm and just had this really powerful experience. So I thought it was just like really relatable and a great story. So that one's in the blog, Healing Trip Tales. Really encourage everyone to check it out. Uh, we worked really hard on this one, and I'm really proud of it. Um, and then um, just earlier this week, we released a podcast with the founders of that foundation, Vets. That's Amber and Marcus. Um, I think Marcus is a veteran, right? Um, yeah. Is Amber as well? Um, I don't believe so. Um, so yeah, Marcus was a former Navy SEAL. Um, cool. yeah, yeah, it's like a Navy, they, do they specifically work with Navy SEALs? It seems like it. Yeah. Um, it seems like that's their primary focus. Um, they're, they're of course interested in other um, types of veterans, but, um, they find that the Navy SEAL conversation might be most effective for moving the needle. Um, because I think we need probably 20 to a hundred nonprofits like this to help yeah. support those in need. And from what I understand, just like helping to edit this piece was that it's a really specific culture, Navy SEAL culture, a really intense one. It's a really hard mindset to transition back into real like regular life from the Navy SEAL mindset. And so, um, you know, maybe psychedelics and their flexibility enhancing qualities can help folks with that, as well as with, you know, the the post-traumatic stress and the, you know, traumatic brain injury and other more clinical things involved. So really interesting pieces of work um, in that regard. And then also we have a new uh, contributor to the blog, uh, Dr. Amanda Kahn. Um, she wrote uh, a related article on moral injury, describing like what that is, how it's different than post-traumatic stress, but very similar. And how psychedelics might be able to help and how moral injury also might be like contributing to anxiety and depression um, in folks um, that have experienced traumas or you know, maybe traumas with a lowercase t, uh, things like first responders, even to the pandemic, first responders to 9-11, um, you know, and veterans and just how kind of like the disconnect between what they believe to be their own like morality and what's right and then what they're like have to do for their job or these kinds of things and how that disconnect can can really affect folks emotionally and then how maybe psychedelics can help, 
you know, forgive yourself or learn to live with yourself instead of just punish yourself um, post these really intense experiences. So I found that article to be really enlightening. I learned so much about moral injury and just these different aspects of this, you know, realm. And I encourage folks to go look for that as well. And Amanda's a great new contributor. I'm really looking forward to what else she has to offer. I really found this piece really cool. So definitely go check that out. It's a little bit different. It's not just the everyday story of, oh, veteran, you know, comes back damaged, goes to retreat, and is totally healed. Like We kind of understand that's not exactly how it'll be, but psychedelics can definitely help folks you know, adjust to their, to their new lives. And so um, some really interesting content in the blog and in the podcast this week. <laughs> yeah, totally. So yeah, this is, it's a really important topic. It's a really important um, story. This has been a really helpful set of stories for the psychedelic movement in general and it's also life-saving it's not just like story important it's really saving lives and um what's the number 22 suicides a day roughly in america veteran suicides and that's not okay and we need to do better and um, the number's probably higher if we want to include like you know drunk driving accidents that were willful and other things to like accidental you know. overdoses, I think could contribute to that. <sighs> That's a big one. Yeah, yeah. And what happens if you pull a gun on a cop with the intention of the cop killing you? Like that's, that's definitely common. It's really sad. Um, but it's, it's something that some people do just, um, yeah. Anyway. Um, so check those out. I think these are really great and I, I really hope to do more. I, for whatever reason I'm attached to this veteran topic and, um, would, would love well, to be able important. to help these folks more. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, just the, I mean, you know, what veterans, right, do for this country, but then how the country responds when they get back. Like, oh, yeah, we have a couple holidays, and then, like, what, you just move on and expect people to just quickly adapt back? Like, obviously, going from such an intense mindset, like being overseas at war or something like that, and then coming back, to civilian life is just so challenging and any resources we can help people so that they're not, you know, taking their own lives or, or, you know, anything else that's so damaging instead of, we want them to be, you know, welcome back into our society and, and giving them resources to help them do that. And there's just really not a lot out there. And so, yeah, trying our best (laughs) to provide something. For Absolutely. sure. And happy Memorial Day, everyone. It's a little late, but I hope everyone had a really nice long weekend. Um, I know I did. <laughs> yeah, it was just great. Just great to be able to see people. Um, got to get with a lot of my friends and uh, we had a nice, nice little hang in Denver. It's uh, nourishing, to say the least. Mm, lovely. <laughs> yeah. It was really cold on the East Coast. It was like winter again. I was in, I didn't have any of the right clothes. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> but it was beautiful not to just think about work and to just reset and yeah, spend time with friends and family for sure. <laughs> um, cool. So let's jump into the amazing news out of California, SB 519, which is a uh, Scott Wiener, I'm thinking state Senator um, bill to decriminalize mushrooms past the California state Senate. And um, what's next, Michelle? Like, did we have to go through like a health committee or something before it goes to the governor? Um, that's a really great question. <laughs> I think I have this article from Lucid up that that covers it. Let me try to find that. Um, but this is definitely a big topic. And what happens when a whole state goes decriminalized? We're kind of starting down this same path that cannabis went down like twenty years ago. Yeah, exactly. It is a really big deal. It's not quite passed yet, but um, this was a big step that folks weren't 100 percent sure like if it would happen. And so the fact that it's gotten this far is a really big deal. And we've been talking about this bill a little bit in the past on Solidarity Fridays, but, you know, it will remove criminal penalties for possessing or sharing um, a lot of different psychedelics, both, you know, plant-based and synthetic. So psilocybin mushrooms, but also DMT, LSD, MDMA, um, ibogaine, um, mescaline, but not from peyote, but um, other types. And uh, yeah, like I think it's, it's a really big deal. Yeah. Because statewide 
uh, that would be the first time that this happened. So if you're, you know, following the decrim news, we've had a bunch of city ordinances like Denver, Oakland, um, but this would be the first state one. Um, mm. It is just simple decriminalization, but, um, you know, legislators uh, are hoping, like the analysis, the analysis, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> are uh, hoping that it'll not. It'll also, you know, make lawful personal possession as well as social sharing of these substances. So, like the gift grow, uh, what's that model called? The uh, grow gift. Mm. And, <laughs> wow, I am not on it today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a couple weeks in the garden state doing uh, that to you. <laughs> but, so. Um, <laughs> I got this from marijuana moment. I don't know if lucid news. I don't know. What 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 is the next step, Joe? Do you have it in front of you? Um, when I was reading the article, it suggested that there's a health and safety committee that now needs to ratify it. Um, and then after that, I believe the governor, it would go to the governor's desk. I, it could be quite un- inaccurate here. I've got this chart um, on lucid news um, about like what happens. Um, so, yeah, so it looks like that's that's about accurate. And um, so we should be seeing more news on this really soon. Um, so over the next week to three weeks, we'll see you know where this actually lands. Do the health and safety people want to push back on it? And do we win? Um, I tend to think this is going to pass. Um, but, you know, even if it doesn't pass... You know, one more year of successful stories of psychedelic research than it should. Um, I saw another kind of uh, comment I wish I cited, but um, one third of Americans now think that mushrooms can be used therapeutically. Wow. Right? It's huge. Compare that to three years ago, like (laughs) 2% maybe. Um, So we've come a long way and things are moving quickly. Things are moving faster than we can understand. Um, I think it's, it's politics of revolution. Like, you know, once we got this wave, things really go quickly. Yeah. Um, this could open the door for other states, not just cities. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and what else? I mean, what do you think could be next? Like if this passes and it's decrimmed, do you think so, California like, obviously will Obviously just like Oakland. Like yeah. I, well, I think it's going to be a little bit like the cannabis world. Yeah. Like there was the there were these underground sellers for a long time, right? In the cannabis world. And, um, you know, they're producing at such levels that they could certainly get criminal offenses, but it doesn't mean that, you know, certain kinds of, you know, dealers, sellers, marketers can't possess a little bit and sell it at below that quantity. So I think we'll see an increase in sales, um, due to lesser, um, restrictions you know there's all these plants you can grow and sell now and you know if you just if you stash your asset all over the place you're you know less at risk of criminal offenses <laughs> um, little squirrel holes all over it's just little personal use amounts and little that would be my house right. if i live in california <laughs> Yeah, right. But I also think this opens the door for safer growing, especially of mushrooms, right? Because um, I feel like I read that somewhere. Let me take a look at my notes. A provision for home grow and manufacture. It says in the Marijuana Moment article that, um, which is called California Senate approves bill to legalize possession of psychedelics like psilocybin and LSD. So the note here, it says for psilocybin specifically, the legislation would repeal provisions in California statute that prohibit the cultivation or transportation of any spores or mycelium capable of producing mushrooms or other material that contain the psychoactive ingredient. And it's like right now, I think you still can't even order spores online in California from most websites and stuff, even though right. like federally it's okay. Um, California had this whole provision against it. So maybe that would open up spore sales and just be a little bit safer for folks to grow their own mushrooms mm-hmm. and share them, you know, with their friends um, and family in California. So interesting stuff for sure. We'll be following this really closely and keeping you all posted because I think everyone in the community is quite excited to see where this one goes for sure. Right. 
like how soon after will legalization happen or like a state level legal for medical sales or whatever it is. Or just um, medical. Could we have mushroom dispensaries, please? Like if I get a little say here. <laughs> apparently this is like Vancouver is all over it. They've got liquid acid for sale, mushrooms for sale. Like yeah, and in like really doing it. I have a friend up there and we had a video call a few weeks ago and he was showing me all this mushroom products he's bought in the underground market. It's not legal, but people are taking a page out of cannabis's book and the marketing, like the boxes are all cute and designed really nice and there's Mm -hmm. dosing and, you know, set and setting info, which is how I understand they had it in Amsterdam years ago when you would buy mushrooms and maybe still when you buy truffles, it comes with a little, like just a little pamphlet, you know, it's basically like the three page version of my book. That's just like, (laughs) here's some dosing ideas, be in a relaxed place, like expect these things and good luck, you know? And I think that is what's going to be necessary. I also kind of feel like that wouldn't hurt with cannabis, you know, especially on higher dose edibles, (laughs) a little bit of harm reduction information in the packaging can go a long way. Um, and just keeping people safe and educated. Not everyone knows as much as we do. Um, and I understand that and just helping to spread this knowledge. Yeah. Once you learn how to use things safely, it's really not, you know, such a big deal. So right. It's exciting. You know, you get a few accidents under your belt. It's easier to bounce back and why wouldn't you like include a little bit of harm reduction data in there? Um, yeah. This and, might, I don't know. Have oh, you yeah. seen these like Wonka bars and like high end looking chocolate bars with psilocybin in them? Have you seen those around? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I've seen like the high design pill bottles. They look like something you would buy like a Whole Foods. Yeah, um, totally. Those are funny. I feel like um, now everyone's mom is asking for those, you know, like they don't really want like a handful of mushrooms or a bag of nasty tasting dried shrooms. But you hand your mom like a pill, fancy pill bottle with little 0.1 milligram micro doses and like, <laughs> you know, things change. Yeah, just like the perception. I mean, marketing, even though like whatever it can be lame, but like the role it plays is really important and making people feel safe. Um, and just, yeah, it really just makes a big impression on people when, when things look professional, even if they're still in the underground market. So, but yeah, I think that's actually maybe a good transition to talk about. I know this wasn't our initial order, but there was an article that came out of Florida, which I feel like is quite related Um, Let me just pull it up. But CBS, like really mainstream, obviously, news organization, um, had a headline out of St. Augustine, Florida. Um, Sorry, just pulling this up. Former sheriff says Florida should legalize magic mushrooms. And um, David Shore, who's a former four-term sheriff of St. John's County, Um, is basically and a U.S. Army veteran um, and former police chief and former president of the Florida Sheriff's Association revealed his support for magic mushroom legalization for the first time publicly in an interview with CBS 12 News in Florida. Um, He has this great quote that says, (laughs) what these substances seem to be able to do is create additional pathways of the mind involving neurons and synapses to appreciate things at different levels. Like, yes. And then he says those levels allow you to be more productive, happier and more comfortable in your own skin. How can that not be a good thing? Like, it's pretty crazy for that to be like the mainstream article for legalizing psilocybin mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Just considering how maybe cops or just anyone sort of mainstream is talking about mushrooms like three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Like, just such a huge difference. Um, And I think it's really speaking to this whole kind of growing movement in our country to... To, I mean, I want to say legalize, but at least like decriminalize and 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 have access for people to have mushrooms for therapeutic use and personal growth. So it's just so crazy and exciting to watch these dominoes fall and um, see what happens next. <laughs> and to make sure we interject a little bit of politics, like this is clear evidence that this is not a partisan issue. It's not just yeah. a left only issue. Like um, it doesn't get you know, typically speaking far, much more right than a Florida sheriff. Right. So <laughs> right? like we're in really good, you know, the movement I think is very healthy as a result of that kind of thing. 
and um, yeah, just we've got to be able to speak to both sides of the aisle here about this stuff. And it's unfortunately not all about aliens and angels, though so that'd be I mean, fun. But there is space. a medical <laughs> side here, and um, thankfully, people are becoming aware that oh, it's it's not all about party. And then you know perhaps they're seeing oh. Like whiskey is pretty bad compared to cannabis. Maybe my narrative around the drug war is outdated or outmoded or whatever. Yeah. Um, and maybe they're seeing that with mushrooms too. Oh, your friend that takes mushrooms like once a month is actually pretty chill, even <laughs> though that person doesn't drink. Um, so they're actually maybe like the nicest, most understanding person you have in your life. Possibly not always, but I think there there's a case to be made about using mushrooms intentionally to just even if you don't have, you know, a clinical mental health diagnosis, like to just being a more compassionate person. I think if you use it in, within like that intention, like it doesn't happen to everyone just by taking mushrooms. But if you really want to be a more understanding person and you use mushrooms for that purpose, it can really work that way. Um, but, you know, that might be another another conversation. I, I do feel like this sheriff, he had a really great point in the article um, where he talks about like a lot of th- Uh, times where folks are calling the police, it actually is having to do with some kind of mental health issue, right? And so he has a quote here that says, I think law enforcement will take anything we can get to help people suffering from mental illness because 60% of the things we deal with involve mental illness. And it's a really great point. I mean, yeah, mushrooms might not solve everyone's mental health problems, but you know, if it starts to help society at large, maybe, yeah, there'll be less need for, uh, you know, calling the cops on every issue and getting them involved in situations that actually ends up escalating things and making them more dangerous than less. And so, I mean, I think that's such a advanced point for him to take and so cool. And I do hope that that's the trajectory, but I don't know. I really do want any- to get some of these leap people on. The uh, law enforcement against prohibition, which I re- recently changed their name, um, <clears throat> but they would be a really great organization to chat with and build some bridges with. Yeah, Kyle, any thoughts on that Florida one? Um, yeah, I mean that first quote that you mentioned, uh, Michelle, kind of really stood out to me. Just thinking about um, just how he's speaking about it almost makes me feel like the science is really hitting a lot of people. Like just hearing that statement of like neurons and synapses and you know, the way that it's interacting with the brain, like it sounds like, you know, people are are actually listening to some of the science and yeah, just the aspect about mental health I think is really important. Um, And yeah, how many, how many like, yeah, calls are, are mental health related and why it could be really important for law enforcement to really kind of be up on that. I remember when I was living in Burlington, they tried to uh, include some social workers on the task force for responding because there were some reports of um, cops shooting, you know, getting called to a place and having to shoot. Sh- they ended up shooting somebody with schizophrenia. And it's just like. Yeah, how do we really Yeah, that happens to, all the time, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, stress the importance of just mental health training. Um, really important. Yeah, mm. it's so important. Um, and so interesting that, yeah, people are catching on to this, this kind of science-based narrative, which is great, rather than a stigma, like fear-based one, right? And in the same article, they start talking about the recent uh, New England Journal of Medicine article that we've been talking about a lot, that Robin Carhart-Harris was the lead author that showed that psilocybin could be just as effective or more than, you know, Lexapro or common SSRI. And I thought it was funny that it was mentioned in CBS News because I was just over Memorial Day at this like family party. It was my best friend's whole family. And he has like four siblings and two of them have all these kids. And, you know, it's this like fun family party. And his oldest brother, (laughs) who's a doctor, you know, was like sitting across from me at dinner and was like, Michelle, did you read this new, uh, New England Journal of, uh, you know, medicine article on psilocybin? And I was like, well, yeah, it's my job. I interviewed the head researcher and all this stuff. But, you know, he had read it and he was so excited about it. And he's just like a family doctor. And 
And just like, mm. it's just so interesting what like normal, he's kind of normal. I mean, I think he goes to Burning Man, but so he kind of knows. But like, <laughs> just like, you know, what the mainstream, what professionals, what doctors and sheriffs are starting to hear about magic mushrooms and share at their family parties with kids running around and like all this kind of thing uh, is so fascinating. And so, yeah, I mean, we're really starting to get the mainstream's attention and, um, it's great. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, like my 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 friends who are doctors that I grew up with, they're all now far more interested and treat me as far more legitimate than they ever really have um, <laughs> based on, you know, all of this stuff. So it's, it's kind of nice. It's helping me personally. Same. <laughs> Not feel like a kook um, when yeah, I'm Yeah, everyone's starting to I'm, take me seriously. Like, what is this? <laughs> It's weird, yeah, right? Like, oh, finally, like I'm the serious person in the room. It's so yeah. weird. They're like, oh, you're not the weirdo. You were just really ahead of your time. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. duh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Let's talk about these cicadas. Okay. Um, so uh, what was that article from Michelle? It was a really yeah, interesting article Yeah, Smithsonian Magazine, so like the museum. Um, right. It's called A Fungus Causes Cicadas to Mate Like Crazy Even After Their Butts Fall Off. You know, really great professional <laughs> title. But there's it's like a, a funny line, their butts fall off. <laughs> but it literally happens, like physically. So, okay, so let me explain. Let me explain the whole story here. So, well, A, now that I'm on the East Coast, cicadas are everywhere. So they're on my mind. Like they're just, they're coming out of the ground for the first time in like seven years or something. And they're everywhere. So I was... Uh, hiking along the Delaware with a friend of mine this weekend from high school, uh, foraging for mushrooms, obviously. And he was telling me this story too. So I had to look up, look it up and, and look into it. And so apparently, um, some cicadas get infected with various species of the fungus Massospora. I think I'm saying that right. Please feel free to correct me if I'm not. Um, and, and things start to get freaky. I'm quoting Smithsonian Magazine. Um, the fungus can take over a cicada's body, eating through their limbs, and it also makes the male sex crazed. They frantically try to mate with anything they can find, even after their genitalias and butts have literally fallen off. So there's where that silly, like, childish title comes from. But the really interesting part of this that is psychedelic adjacent is that the scientists have uncovered, and this is from a 2019 um, research study that they're quoting from in, fu- in the journal Fungal Ecology, um, a team of researchers have revealed that certain species of massospora produce psychoactive con. Pounds um, as they infect their unfortunate victims. Um, and so mm. one of the compounds is synthetic cathinon. How Cathinone. do you say it? Cathinons? Which are. Well, let's not call it synthetic. Uh, right, because they're not. They're natural. Derived. Cathinone. Yeah. yeah. Cathinone, which um, are more. They're yeah, stimulants. Cathinone. They're a type of amphetamine. And, you know, they can be known as bath salts um, in the. That's like you know, the synthetic cathinone. Drug culture. Um, Bath salts. Yeah. Yeah. So these are natural cathinones. Um, but also, so this same, um, so this same family of fungi, um, Massospora, can um, produce psilocybin. So that's why I was interested. Sorry, it took me so long to get to that, everyone. <laughs> um, and it's, it was actually really interesting because it's the first fungi that's like not a fruiting mushroom that psilocybin is produced in. But also, so like this fungus takes over the cicada's body like until like their limbs are falling off. Um, but that same fungus is, is contains, yeah, possibly psilocybin and this type of amphetamine. And so the joke with my friend foraging in the woods this weekend was like when we were finding all these cicada shells like everywhere, it was like, well, if you found one with like a white fungus coming out of it and you ate it or you ate a lot of them, like could that produce a psychedelic experience? Would it be a really speedy one? Because she eats like psilocybin and amphetamines at the same time. Like, is this some new weird natural drug combination? Um, the scientists in the article don't recommend it because there could be other compounds in this that could be toxic or dangerous. 
However, I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts on this, but I think it's fascinating and so crazy. And why does it make the male so sex crazed? I have a few theories, but maybe you guys have some others. <laughs> well, the first thing that came to mind for me was, you know, yes, eating them. Like, are you going to have an effect? But then I'm like, it's kind of weird because there's going to be so much else in there. Yeah. And then um, the next question is, can you collect a whole mess of these things well, yeah. and do an extract? Yeah. Um, end up with a big pile of cathinone and powdered psilocybin. Um, could and you? Bug protein. Is it worth your time too when you can grow mushrooms? So these are valid questions that you got to ask yourself because no, none of these stories are really talking about content by weight. Like if the insect is, you know, two grams, how many milligrams of psilocybin are in there? Um, It'd be a and, you lot. Know, we'll probably have to measure a thousand to get a good like sample set for that. Some big um, bug smoothie, but still, it's ugh. so fascinating. <laughs> it's disgusting. And the sex craze thing is interesting. Like, is there an amphetamine component on insects? And it's it's hard to talk about like insect reproductive systems and like draw an analogy over to like animals or sorry humans. Um, so you know, amphetamines this happens in humans, and similarly, psilocybin it can. This is actually a topic I want to get into eventually is like, what are the kind of like social sexual implications of psilocybin use? Like what happens to somebody after Burning Man or after an NYU trial? Like do things change substantially there for them? And is there enough informed consent around this? Hmm. Um, because some people have relationships ruined um, by jumping into psychedelic stuff. Um, not just being a study participant, but even recreational use can throw your whole world for a loop. Um, possibly for the better, but I'm not going to make that judgment call for other people. Um, so it's it's a really interesting angle. But Kyle, anything on cicadas for you? <laughs> oh man, what an interesting article. Um, I mean, I think just like from a pharmacological and like chemistry perspective, just really cool to know like that this fungus uh, has some cathinones in it and just thinking about like drug production, like, you know, it could, as you said, Joe, like able to uh, maybe harvest this fungus, grow it in lab and see if you could come up with any sort of, um, yeah, new extraction or, or maybe new drug compounds there. Um, so I just think that's, that's always fascinating when people find new species and find, um, you know, the, the compounds in there that, um, you know, could potentially benefit people down the line to some degree. I mean, when we think about any sort of medication, most of it came from plants, right? Um, or, or maybe animals, right? I'm thinking like the poison dart frog. I think that ended up being um, turned into some sort of anesthetic, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, just a, just a funny article. Um, yeah, and I was just thinking about cathinones, like what other uh natural plants out there that we know about that create cathinones i i haven't really done too much research on cot cat cot this is the first one i've heard um, of but yeah, the yeah. african plant k h a t um that has cathinones in it as well um oh cool yeah i would love to grow some yeah, um, right. is it scheduled like i i think it might be scheduled or just like um, I know it's, it's somewhat illegal in some countries. Well, isn't that the part Let's of the Wikipedia point of bath salts is, is saying, that like, they were legal? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, a cathinone is a Schedule One drug, so you know I'm sure if you had if you were maybe using, yeah, cat, then you'd it'd probably fall under that if you were using it for uh, that that reason, right? Right. So it looks, I'm just looking through the Wikipedia post. There's a lot of illegal countries and a lot of legal countries. Interesting. Yeah. yeah and mm. another just interesting part of this that I keep thinking of is like, you know, what's, what's the, like, what's the, 
you know, nature's motive here. And like, so in the article, they talk a little bit about like after the cicadas get infected, you know, their abdomens eventually like slough off, revealing the white fungus plug that then sprinkles its spores as the host flies around. So it actually doesn't kill the host right away. Like they survive with it and it's spreading like these. a good parasite. Yeah. Like a little, little, little and bit it's longer. Spreading these spores to grow more psilocybin containing fungus like around the forest. And because like, so when they fly around or mate and then the article says, and boy, do infected cicadas mate a lot. <laughs> it's this really funny voice in this article, but it says males will try to copulate not only with females but also with other males which is beautiful happy pride month everyone and not even losing parts of their bodies like including their own genitals um and only like does that like eventually slow down the lusty cicadas like so it's just really interesting with this i don't know like nature always fascinates me and like they are still trying to figure out like the purpose of psilocybin at all. Like, and they, there's some theories on evolutionary biology sense. Yeah. You know, Mm. and like, there's some theories on, it might be like an insecticide or it might, um, you know, be attractive to some types of animals that then they would spread the spores and this whole kind of thing. And it's still kind of mysterious, which I love obviously. And, and this kind of fits into that. It's like, wow, like, What's the point of cicadas spreading a psilocybin containing fungus all over the mm. East Coast right now? Like it doesn't feel it feels a little a little intentional on nature's part. <laughs> so I don't know. That's the kind of thing that I stay up late at night thinking about. <laughs> so I want to mention that cordyceps mushrooms, cordyceps mushrooms uh-huh. will infect yeah. ants and I've often have those. ants go to the highest point and it colonizes inside of their body. And they sporulate once they get to that highest point in, you know, whatever and disperse environment. So, and that highest right. point thing so interesting. So then they could disperse the most, like, exactly. yeah, right? Like, and it's kind of one of these zombie viruses, which seems a little different from the cicada thing. I think um, they did mention that process in this article a little as, like, an example of what else happens in nature. And this one's different because the cicada actually stays alive for a little while and keeps mating and flying around, dispersing its spores. But that delay is, like, a really good tactic for anything, like a virus or fungus. So, like, maybe the mating is, like, to spread it more so that the population is, you know, infinitely colonized. Well, like, 100% colonized going, you know, into this next 12-year cycle. So 12 years, they go away. 17, I think. I keep reading, but I feel like I read that every year in the newspaper on the East Coast. I know, right? They're like, they're emerging. Cicadas come up for the first time. (laughs) They emerge every year. But it's also kind (laughs) of interesting, like, um, yeah, like, I don't know. There's so much to this, and I wonder, like, has that like mycelium been underground for 17 years is this like a really old psilocybin like or i don't know like my friend had all these theories when we were foraging he's like mushrooms don't exist in this time (laughs) you know like they're outside at time and they're doing all these weird things and there's just like i don't know there's a lot there's a lot to be played with there but thought we just draw everyone's attention to that if you want to read more about it it was in smithsonian magazine and i bet there's other um other content about this as well but it's it's really fascinating especially if you're picking out all these cicada shells from like your car windshield and stuff if you're on the east coast right now um because now every time i, I assumed one, i would see some in colorado but there's none um, funny which is pretty weird uh but enjoy them while you can everybody <laughs> i wonder if it's too high altitude all right, well, there oh right, yeah but let's move on <laughs> uh, you know what yeah it might be it might be too high here where i live mm. but I'll ask my Denver friends if they're down there. Um, So next up, cannabis at the federal level. This is a really big deal. Um, So the monopoly uh, that NIDA had through that University of Mississippi is over. Yeah. And now multiple companies can now provide cannabis for research purposes. I have some questions about the illegality and like why it was impossible for these groups to get access. But let's talk about the good first. So... What did, what did you read, Michelle? Like five different companies now have licenses to grow for federal you know, research projects? Something like research. that. And this, so this piece is in NPR um, on May 30th. It's called After 50 Years, U.S. Opens the Door to More Cannabis Crops for Scientists. And they do interview some of the companies that will be able to grow the, you know, sanctioned weed. 
Um, but basically, if folks didn't know, like in the past, like right now or up until now, um, any like study that wanted to look at like cannabis in any regard, like for PTSD or just like how it works in the brain, they could, there was only one source in the U S it was like at some university in Mississippi and researchers for like 30 years have been complaining about how bad this weed is. Like literally it's just not up to snuff with what you can buy either on the, you know, underground market or in dispensaries. It just doesn't compare. And so the research studies, you know, have never really been good enough to really understand, like, what's happening in the real world when folks use cannabis medicinally or recreationally or a combination of the two. And so this is really exciting. I think it's going to lead to, like, a boom of a lot more cannabis research and probably pharmaceutical products. So now there's going to be, like, I think at least five companies and they won't all have to be universities too. I think some of them are private companies who are growing their own, you know, like dispensary grade cannabis and and now like the researchers like Sue Sisley and these other researchers who are quoted in the piece who have been working um you know, trying to do cannabis research forever will finally have cannabis that's, you know, of a good enough quality to really get a good idea of like how this is working or not working for folks. It was so weak before that it like, I'm really, really excited about this research because I think some of the cannabis is even maybe too strong for certain things and, and figuring out Mm -hmm. maybe like, you know, now we can have more options of like also like edibles, tinctures, whatever, the difference between smoking and vaping and maybe the difference between 20% THC and 10 and maybe 10 is better for anxiety, but 20 is better for depression. Like I have no idea. That's not medical advice. But all these kinds of things, we have no idea. It often feels like we have more research on MDMA and psilocybin than we do on cannabis when cannabis is available in like 30 states for people to purchase. So it's really exciting. I think, yeah, we're about to see a lot of really exciting cannabis studies coming out, which finally, I can't believe it's been this long. I'm trying to find out how many uh, companies, but my computer is quite slow, so I might not be able to find that. It keeps freezing. So over. my main concern with the, like the way it was before was, you know, not only is the cannabis weak, but are they doing subpar grow intentionally? Like, are they trying to make mm. really bad cannabis intentionally? Because it's NIDA. NIDA doesn't like drugs um, or any kind of psychoactives, for that matter, it seems. Um, you know, were they doing it intentionally so that the data looked worse on cannabis as a whole? Um, or was it just like, we don't have any incentive to change? Like, this is our monopoly and we're going to hold on to it? Was it that kind of a deal? And then, you know, where, why were groups unable to do any research. That part doesn't make any sense to me. If it was a, you know, if you hold a federal, you know, a bank account that's insured by the federal government, perhaps they could seize it if you were buying at the state level and doing research, perhaps. If you're a university accepting federal funds, you have to be really careful around cannabis or they could cut off your federal funds. Um, but, you know, why wouldn't like a consortium of companies in California or Colorado fund their own state level group? Because um, it's still federally yeah. a schedule one substance, I think, is mm-hmm. the short answer. But even though we're dealing with like a two point one billion dollar merger in Florida of two grows. Yeah. Um, recently. And it's like, how does that how do we square these things? It didn't like, make we can any do sense. Capitalism, but we can't do research. Yeah. There's a and statement like, here. It's about dangerous, like, really. Like it. Uh, I was just going to say, there's a statement here in, in the article about limitations, um, saying that that you know it's still Schedule One. It says, um, you know, even with more growers coming online, it's still no means easy or easy to study cannabis because researchers need a special license when working with Schedule One drug, and grants to conduct these studies are hard to come by. Um, so you know, you're still dealing with still the the politics of research and the university and grants and you know, working with a still a scheduled one substance. And I think the way to push that forward is to get it out of schedule one federal. Um, so yeah. it's like if we were able to abolish that, it'd be hopefully you know. that'll happen next. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's just crazy. I mean, my no, mind, right. I, I think that's the I, reason I think about it. It's like all these States legalizing for recreational medical. And it's like, 
as you know, a country and people society, don't you want good data around products that you're selling? And if like the research isn't there, how are we making good decisions? Like it just seems really counterintuitive that you know you're 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 just you know letting it run wild to some degree, but then also being like, well, we can't study this because it's a Schedule One, and you know we still have to follow all this. It's like, no, wait, people are doing this. Don't you want good data and keep people safe? Like this is just seems so counterintuitive with the drug war. It just makes my mind spin. And go, what the hell are we doing here? Sometimes, <laughs> like, can we get our heads out of our asses and like you know just really help to protect? <laughs> I mean, to protect people, right? Because we don't know like um, some of this stuff, and, and we need to spend more money researching it. And if there's all these roadblocks, especially with cannabis, yeah, crazy. where it's the culture's changing. There's all these stores you can buy. It's so strong. So many people are using it. Like it's way overdue. It doesn't it hasn't made any sense. So that's kind of why, like, I felt like we needed to explain why this is such a big deal because we've been living in this kind of backwards, like alternate universe when it comes to the cannabis research. And so it's exciting. Um, and it is still really hard. I mean, even though there are all these studies on Schedule One substances like cannabis, psilocybin, MDMA, like I think it, people still have to, the researchers have to jump through a lot of hoops. It's much oh, yeah. harder than other types of research. There's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot, really time consuming. And so, and that still hasn't changed, but um, hopefully that's, you know, part of what's slowly coming next, at least with cannabis first. Magic mushrooms might like somehow like sneak into that <laughs> if cannabis got off schedule one. I feel like I don't know. Mushrooms are just like hopping on cannabis and like sneaking in with it. Sometimes <laughs> it just feels like totally. One of the cool things um, about where this is different with psilocybin is that the federal government does not yet have monopoly on production. Um, that said. I don't know how much whole mushroom research is happening domestically Not in the U S but, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a very different deal and I, I'd be hopeful that it's moving faster. It seems like, you know, psilocybin research is more well-funded and ongoing more so than good cannabis research. But now that the culture is so primed with cannabis generally, yeah. I think we're going to see like a real boom. Because you know, researchers can now make really great justifications for allocation of research funds. Like, oh, this is relevant because look how many people are smoking pot or eating edibles or whatever. Yeah. Or flying to Oregon. Or how many Oregon. people are self-treating for can like yeah. cancer. Like true yeah, Oregon, totally. And seizures and kids and all those like really powerful stories that you know dominated the narrative about why we should legalize cannabis just a few years ago, like. So, yeah, and I do feel like with the all these decrim bills like SB 519 that we were just talking about and um, is it 109 up in Oregon? I mean, in a year and a half, we could have crazy tourism up there mm -hmm. for people to go get psilocybin assisted, you know, therapy and other kinds of like group work and retreats and stuff. And so then I mean, I guess the government isn't as far behind with psilocybin. But maybe we'll need some more whole mushroom research. It's a really good point. Everything now is synthetic psilocybin, which is good for studying, but there's definitely other compounds in mushrooms. Different mushrooms have different strengths. You know, as the culture evolves, more people are growing and foraging or buying different species. Like, you know, I think there'll be a demand for much more nuanced research than just psilocybin help my depression it's like well yeah but what kind of mushroom <laughs> yeah. well we'll see i'm hopeful that uh ronan and field trip are doing what 30 different species of psilocybin producing mushroom in, in the jamaica yeah we were talking about yeah. that a few months with ago. the university affiliation and that's cool. like that's really really optimistic because no government regs to get in the way for of you know researching these things and they got a really nice lab um, I don't know what their import mm. export situations like, like getting spores to Jamaica. But, you know, if it's medical research and like the university sponsoring it, it's not impossible. 30 um, different species is so many, too, man. I don't know strains. anyone that's tried strains. that many. <laughs> yeah, because we've got like the the sclerotia producing ones like Tampanensis and then like that's Cubensis, not a strain, though. That's a species. Tampanensis. Is yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So we have species and strains true, true, true. Um, in the mix. So like. 30 total different types but still like 
I didn't want to say speed, just making sure I'm not wrong. <laughs> I'm here for um, that. <laughs> but yeah. like, yeah, I mean, it is actually really hard to get mushrooms that aren't like cubensis, right? I mean, it's like on the West Coast, you can get some wavy caps and um, in England, some liberty caps. In Mexico, there's a few different species. Here, I, I forage some different ones near the Delaware River. I'm not going to tell anyone it's where It's cool to hear about. <laughs> they were ovids, <laughs> I think. I can't. It's really cool. It was so cool to find. Um, I'm going to do an Instagram post about it eventually. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's really cool. It's really exciting. And it's exciting that not only is, like, you know, this kind of underground drug culture all excited about it, but, like, mainstream culture. That's the crazy new part, right? And so, um, yeah, we'll see. Lots of exciting research, I think, on the way. So I'm excited, clearly. <laughs> Third, cool. Um, this no. I was just going to Go say, ahead, like, Kyle. there's one last part here, and I think I we've mentioned this in the past, just about cannabis research and um, just how, like, the psychedelic research is, like, almost way ahead of the cannabis research. And at the end of the article here uh, on yeah. NPR, you know, they do state that. that they're uh, quoting here, despite widespread use of marijuana in the U.S., research in the medical potential of other Schedule I uh, drugs like MDMA much farther along than cannabis. I just find that so fascinating that like, yeah, MDMA, psilocybin are probably so way farther along than cannabis, even though cannabis is on the marketplace in many states. Um, yeah, it just kind of boggle, boggles my mind around the politics of the research. It, <laughs> me too. Yeah, like prohibition just doesn't make any rational sense. I'm so sick of it. It just like boggles my mind every time. Like I'm just... I really like things to make sense, and this does not. <laughs> it drives me insane. Um, no, it's a good point. Thank you for bringing it up, Kyle. So what did we decide um, next? That New York Times Ketamine, opinion? New York Times. So shortish article, but really celebrating ketamine for depression. Yeah, it's what, a personal um, like essay. Take? It's called, I was paralyzed by severe depression. Then came ketamine. Yeah, it's a short opinion piece by a writer called Zoe Boyer. And um, yeah, you're right. Exactly. It, it is kind of it's just it's important because it's in The New York Times and it's telling this pretty miraculous story of a woman who's been depressed like since a child and tried everything was like living with her parents her depression was so bad couldn't care for herself like couldn't get off the couch couldn't just like do anything and then she had some ketamine infusions which um you know she describes the experience and how her doses were increased in like um subsequent infusion experiences i'm pretty sure it's infusions actually i'm like questioning myself yeah between infusions three and four so it wasn't like a you know, the, the shots or the lozenges. Um, and it, you know, she has this kind of dramatic bit where she has like three or four sessions and they're really expensive and she, it's not actually doing anything yet. She has some kind of trippy experiences, but she's still depressed. But then after session four, everything just like falls into place, which I still don't really understand how that works, but maybe it's just not meant for me to. And that she went from, you know, not being able to get off her mom's couch to writing for the New York Times, which I'm like a little jealous and not really, but like, you know, and just like getting her whole life together. She says, literally, my productivity skyrocketed. Within a couple of weeks, I had cleaned and organized my apartment, applied to and been hired at two jobs, started a meditation practice and began learning a new language. Like, damn, calm down. No, sorry. I'm just being a little aggressive. But, um... <laughs> It's a little, so I kind of don't love these narratives, I guess is why I'm a little like aggressive with my language is because it is a little like, it's just kind of mind boggling how this works. How do you go from just totally a zombie of depression to totally switching everything on? Like, is it, you know, is it, I mean, I know ketamine has really strong neurobiological effects and it is helping people like really turn their brains on in this way. And maybe there's some, what's mm. the word, like neuroplasticity happening and these kinds of things. Um, 
or is it is it her psychedelic experience gave her the distance from her depression or is it a combination of like psychosocial spiritual all together and that's why it maybe only works for some people and not for everyone because maybe they don't have all three of those aligned in the right way or uh, maybe Kyle has a lot more insight into this than me but uh, but it's still really important that this is in the New York Times and and getting to this really mainstream audience where, I mean, everyone who reads the New York Times must know someone with really, with depression. And and maybe not everyone has tried this option. So to, to get it out to more people is really exciting. Um, but how it just turns some people on really boggles my mind. I don't know. Um, but I don't know. What did you guys well, Kyle, think Kyle, you're doing, so, you're doing ketamine training right yeah. now. Like where... What are your speculations on this or commentary on this? Um, well, I think it's kind of like this holistic approach, right? It, there is something about like the neuroplasticity window with ketamine, um, back-to-back infusions um, or just back-to-back treatments like that. Um, you know, there is that antidepressant effect of, of ketamine um, that people do get. And, you know, it might be shorter acting than psilocybin and uh, people do report that, but um, you know, I approach it from a, a, this holistic perspective where it's like you have the biochemical aspect where, you know, you are getting some sort of relief. And a lot of people talk about just it feels like, you know, I wasn't really there. I was able to kind of like maybe detach from myself a little bit and get some like, you know, clarity. I'm just thinking about some of the sessions I've had in the past where it's like, oh, yeah, I get to like just step away from my normal way of thinking and and uh, just think about things a little bit differently. Um, and, you know, then if we're talking more kind of like transpersonal or like depth oriented, like, you know, after the fourth, you know, reading this article after the fourth session, what's switched there? Maybe they were able to get th- to some content that they weren't able to get to. Um, so, you know, when we talk about even like doing week long breaths, breath work or just thinking about people that, you know, they know that they're signed up. And I don't know this infusion program had a, a program, right? Usually it's like, you know, you're coming in for a treatment for like six, six infusions. And then there's something about psyche, Right. And so now we're talking about priming psyche for these experiences. If psyche kind of knows that it has X amount of times, maybe it's titrating its process a little bit. Um, And, you know, I even noticed that when I was uh, in Costa Rica having those four ceremonies, the first few were like relationship building. It was like, oh, okay, I'm starting to get to know this a little bit more. And again, coming from this like kind of psyche oriented approach, it's like psyche starting to develop a relationship here. We're starting to like work with the experience in a different way. And then boom, that fourth and final ceremony. I mean, that shot me out. (laughs) Um, It was it was really intense. And, you know, there could be all all sorts of things um, there from, okay, is it that or is it, you know, the concentrations of, um, you know, the the tryptamines in there and the the monoamine oxidase inhibitors and it's all building up and maybe by the fourth time it's a more potent experience. Um, So, you know, I think there's a lot of variables at play when we're thinking about psychedelic treatment and, um, you know, what, yeah, what what does um, promote somebody to change? could be the the biochemical aspect of ooh wow I just feel different I'm able to just like think differently and now oh I get to step outside myself and try new things and then you know start forming new habits um, or yeah psyche is just like all right I'm I'm ready to start to uh, you know start to do some other work um, so yeah I don't know but I hope that's helpful and no it's so it is helpful it's really interesting you mention your own experience. And it also being like three or four ceremonies, because I actually have a similar story now that you said it out loud. I was like, oh, actually, yeah, my first retreat experience, it was with mushrooms, but it wasn't to the third and final ceremony that I really like got there to this. Like, I think I had a mystical experience. I'm still processing it. It was like two years ago. Um, And I have always, you know, kind of thought about it in this context of like, well, it was the highest dose and I was the most comfortable. Finally, I was just like comfortable and really ready to let go where the first two ceremonies were like relationship building, both with the medicine and the people around me, my facilitators, the other yeah. guests, like in my second ceremony in this process, we were allowed to like kind of leave the ceremony space, which I don't think is allowed anymore. And like go on a little nature walk and like connect with each other and really just kind of play like kids looking at tree bark and just like, you know, when you trip on mushrooms with your friends, but it was in this retreat setting. 
And I really just saw all these people for like kind of like who they really were instead of like when I was sober and I like made all these like judgments or impressions. I was like, oh, well, that's, you know, the grandma and this is this person. Like, I don't know. I had all this like other stuff where I had like categorized all these people. And then when we were all on the moderate dose of mushrooms, it was like, oh, you're all just like me. We're all just like kind of struggling to survive day to day and we're not better or worse than each other. And I'm not like scared of you anymore, what you're thinking of me, because I'm judging you and I thought you were judging me and we're in this whole cycle. And then when I finally let all that go and got comfortable with folks, I had this really powerful experience. And and yeah, that could be part like the psyche might and it could be my psyche was like, well, this is the last one. You got to just go for it. Or was I really comfortable or was it a combination of all these elements coming together to finally open me up in that way and I'm still trying to figure it out it's going to be different for every individual and situation but there's definitely something to be said about that for sure yeah it's really interesting and kind of terrifying if you're trying to plan a retreat or training or something because you it's going to be different for everyone. So to have a standard practice is really hard, but also like kind of important. Like, yeah, I really, I struggle with that. So I'm glad I'm not a facilitator. <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> so we circulated this um, study that Robin Carhart Harris and Malin Utauk are, are putting together related to holotropic breathwork. And, um, oh yeah, I saw that. We got some feedback from Lenny. Um, I didn't read this yet. Lenny Gibson, our breathwork teacher, um, and he was talking about how breathwork is more of an art than like a rigorous science. Like the thing that would probably, the thing that unifies holotropic breathwork is the training. Like then everybody kind of does their own jam a little bit. Like there's a core formula of what you're supposed to do, but there's no credentialing or licensing or retraining that's required once you get your certificate. So like you could call it something, not get sued, but have it be really different. So like that's, that's one issue in the study design. I don't know how substantial that is. It's interesting. Um, but Kyle, Letty had some feedback, yeah. right, about this, like, it's more of an art than, like, a, you know, CBT-type protocol. Yeah, I wonder mm-hmm. if Lenny would mind if I read part of this. Um, but, yeah, yeah, essentially. Let's go for it. We can ask permission later. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, one one issue that he, he, he brought up was obviously the safety right now with, with holotropic breath work and, and COVID. But the other thing was... Um, so there's a few of us who undertook the training um, under the full tutelage of Stan and Christina. The focus on holotropic breath work mainly, as mainly a breathing technique badly misses the importance of context, which has led to significant distortion by many who claim to practice it. Trying to bring it under the rubric of science overlooks that the practice of holotropic breath work like most depth therapies, is an art more than a science. Holotropic breathwork at its best does not take place in a few hours. It requires that participants be persuaded into an attitude of open-mindedness and invited into appreciation of community adventure. None of this is to say that some episodes of modified breathing per se uh, cannot elicit experience out of the ordinary, but in this respect, holotropic breathwork is not essentially different from a variety of other practices centered around modified breathing or even practices diverse from uh, ones employing breathing modifications. Bloodletting or the sun dance of the Plains Indians or Haitian uh, voodoo provide extreme examples, but they, of course, stand little chance of making it past an institutional review board um the singular error of focusing on technique or other instance psychedelic substances that they ignore the essence of an experience that transcends any particular circumstance that engendered it the only test of that experience if one were to give a nod to the idea of the quote-unquote test that science makes its watch word um, is that the experience springs to light in the soul and becomes self-sustaining, nourishing, and the curiosity that's uh, requisite uh, for its substance. It's, it is ultimately the nature of the soul that is fundamental matter of interest for extraordinary experience. Its locus cannot be found by those who look here and there, for it lies in that boundless expanse within that no that knows no coordinates. Um, <clears throat> and that's hmm. kind of where we come from at times. This is what... <laughs> 
That's in an email, Lenny. Yeah, Lenny you? teaches us. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, again, he's really coming back yeah, to like but his I just skills. Can't believe that was an email. It feels like you were reading a book. Uh, well, that's Lenny likes <laughs> to, to write Keep like going. that. Uh, sometimes poetic, but um, yeah. I mean, he he does really embody like this philosophical like worldview, bring really bringing soul, bringing whiteheads like uh. You know, his whole thing, I remember at a breathwork workshop, he was saying, like, from the Whiteheadian perspective, if you really want to understand the nature of reality, start with psyche, start with experience. Science in the modern world usually starts with atoms. Um, and, uh, you know, he's like, how many of us have really seen an atom? You know your experience. And, and that, that seems core to a lot. And I think that's what Whitehead is really trying to get at is an actual occasion, actual entity, and to really start with experience for understanding. Um, and so Whitehead kind of brings in more of this like psychological approach to science, um, starting with psychology versus like materialism to some degree. At least that's how I interpret it, listening to Lenny talk about Whitehead all the time. <laughs> No, it's so fascinating. You know, I just keep coming back to this um, question in my mind. Like, like I found this article really interesting, but also like a little confusing because if you had really been depressed your entire life and ketamine or psilocybin like switches you out of it, but like how do you move on from that? Like how if your whole life was depression like I just keep wondering like how do you live post-depression you know like are people like are they really changed do they really need to work really hard to keep it up or like how do you just not slump back into the couch even if you are like turned on by a substance like I don't know I think I often find myself maybe I'm not integrating enough but like sliding back into old patterns that aren't healthy like pretty quickly yeah. and I wonder how people avoid that and like how do they live post-depression like such severe depression like once you like you I don't know do a lot of behavior change yeah yeah if like Harris Carhart Harris said um the brain is mostly a representation of the environment oh that was so cool experience that's a good quote then yeah. <laughs> you know, you've got to do substantial change on behavior and environment. And um, this is why some people suggest going multiple gas tanks of a drive away for your session and hole up there so you can develop these new patterns and solidify these patterns. Like uh, COVID is an interesting time because people aren't in their normal patterns from years ago. They're in a whole new thing. Like, oh, you had this really intense um, period of isolation kind of like a crucible in alchemy and you're just cooking and cooking and cooking for what well over a year so now you throw in the ketamine on top and pop you know like it could be like that there's so many different ways of talking about this um and obviously this is an exceptional case like ketamine isn't as extraordinary as some of these other compounds but it still can be life-saving for many people um yeah. Certainly interesting. I, I like it, it as a drug, generally speaking. Um, Same. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's hard to really dislike it. And I wanted to mention, like, I was reading um, Kyle James Hillman, The Psychology of Alchemy, recently, and he had this whole line similar to what we're talk you were talking about there with Whitehead of, um, like, this project of psychology of alchemy, kind of like Jung's look at psychology and post-Jungian depth world of, like, being a process of psychologizing the world and like um, objectifying the inner landscape. Um, it's really interesting. It's kind of this reversal from the way we do things currently. Um, and it goes back to Lenny's line. Philosophy wasn't psychological enough and psychology wasn't philosophical enough um, <laughs> yeah. for him. So you have to do a PhD in both to get to the bottom of it. Um, <laughs> not my path, but um, I'm gl grateful he did that. <laughs> but it's, you know, what it, what is going on here? Like why... Why is psychology not philosophical enough? Are we making mistakes by not being philosophical enough? And, you know, I, <clears throat> bold, bold statement here. Are we shortchanging humanity and the progress of science by only accepting randomized controlled trials as the gold standard of data? Is there, right. are there things that are more cost effective and quicker? Like, let's test 20 drugs and skip placebos. So we have data on 20 drugs. Um, as opposed to like how much more data do we need on placebo as part of RCTs? 
well, RCTs are amazing. It's, you know, there's a lot of drugs left to test. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. I think I that's why know. I, I like Hillman. Stuck there, but... Sorry, we, we got a, a little bit of a lag here, it's at least on my end. Um, but yeah, I mean, no that's worry. like you one thing Kyle. like... Sorry about that. <laughs> that's like one thing like Hillman's point is, is how do we bring psyche back into psychology? And I think, you know, Hillman really kind of brings a lot of like the philosophy back into it and bringing psyche at the forefront of it. Um, and I don't know, when I hear that, like that speaks to me because um, I think there's something deep in my process that like when I started to stumble across him, I'm like, ah, oh, man, this guy's speaking my language. Um, cause it's like everything I've been trying to work with over the years and boom, it's just like right here. Um, and I, th- I and again, I probably mentioned this on, on previous podcasts, but yeah, there is some sort of deep soul making aspect to my process here on earth. And I think that really stems from my near death experience. And, um, you know, there's a lot of complexity to it. And, you know, uh, Michelle, you bring like, how, how does somebody just, you know, create these changes? And I also would love to point out that these are articles being published. And so how honest are we being about our own process and what actually gets published? I mean, I could sit there and present you a really great story about my near death experience and how it really changed my life um, and how it motivated me to do all this stuff. And my psychedelic experience helped me to process my trauma. And I went to school and, you know, I could show you all the highlights. But how many of us are actually showing the trenches of our reality and the descent into those valleys? Um, not so much. I mean, shit, I have so many ups and downs. I mean, there's some days where I steep really low because some of those existential themes creep back from my near death experience. And I go, what is all this shit? Why am I getting, you know, that stuff still, I'm still integrating and I'm still working with it many, many years later. That's like part of who I am at this point. And, you know, I don't know we should talk about that because I think as a culture, especially now, Instagram culture, we curate, right? We want to just show the highlights and we're not actually talking about these deeper valleys where actually I think some of that soul making happens where you get into those depressions, you get into these really tough emotions that are actually starting to create a deeper change um, over a longer period of time. And I think that's like, that's what I'm really interested in. It's like, what are these valleys that you're really starting to like get into and learn um, from yourself to actually create a much longer uh, change than just really kind of like, hey, I hiked this mountain, got a really good view, took a picture of it, captured it, and now I'm showing everybody how beautiful it is. Um, it's much more up and down, at least my process. Like as, as much inner work I've done, you know, it's not all highs. Like I've been in the valleys for a long time after some of these sessions. I've, and again, like, you know, Joe, you pointed out like Carhartt Harris's, like going back to environments that aren't necessarily nourishing or growth oriented. I mean, that shit is like trudging yeah. through mud. And you're like, God damn it. Like, of course it's going to be easy to slip back into old habits and old mm-hmm. patterns because you're a product of that environment and you're constantly trying to battle it. And, you know, you really need to stay strong. Um, and, you know, have that thing, that thing that draws you forward in life. Um, you know, that's, what's the motivating factor for me is like, I, you know, I, I made a joke to a, well, not really a joke, but a statement to a friend when I first moved back to, to Jersey. I mean, a lot of people around here, I don't know how it was uh, growing up where you grew up, but a lot of people sank into drugs and just really bad behaviors. And, I mentioned on the show a lot of like just not like close friends, but, you know, friends of friends, this whole you know, group, like a lot of them died from like drug overdoses and, you know, moving back here, you know, I could feel the, 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 the heavy energy of like family, old friends, this and that. And it's like, you know, I'm glad I have something that keeps me focused. I'm glad I have some sort of soul purpose because I could see that those that may not have had that it's so easy to get sucked into, you know, that downward spiral. Um, and yeah, I've, I've definitely felt it here and there of being in this environment. We're like, fuck. <laughs> um, I guess I'm like thinking about it a lot lately. Cause I am back home for this whole month and yeah, I'm like, wow. But it's actually the first, like I've been doing coming home for a month for like seven years. Cause I don't live here anymore. And I think that this is like the best trip I've had where I'm like not letting things like get to me as much maybe I am actually making progress in my own process because I don't know I feel like 
I don't know, not as like things aren't as personal anymore. Maybe I also have this like really driving passion. I mean, we're doing it together right now and that helps. And I I see what you mean. And yeah, I had a very similar experience. Listeners know me and Kyle grew up like 30 minutes from each other. So it's really not that different and um, interesting. No, I'm glad you went into that. It's how they put some things into perspective just in my own personal life. But I think this can help listeners too. just try to work through some of this. And I think Joe also made a really good point is you're right. This is what get published in the New York times because it's easy, digestible, little sound bit in the Sunday paper or whatever. And the, the, the reality of it is it's not this easy. And that's, I guess maybe why this article kind of irritated me slightly, even though I thought it was important and I was the one that suggested we talk about it, but it was like, I guess I want to see more of the valleys and I'm, and I'm really into commissioning work and trying to produce work that, Shows both sides of the picture, not just, yeah, the curated Instagram pretty parts, which, I mean, I'm just as guilty of as anyone else as, you know, highlighting in my own reel or whatever, but. Well, it takes a a sense of vulnerability to really share your process. (laughs) And you have to be pretty confident to even approach that sense of vulnerability. And I think I'm only approaching that level of confidence in my 32 years. It took me a while to get here. But um, no, thanks. I appreciate that. I think that was really insightful. <laughs> it's really helpful at Dream Shadow to have so many people mo- um, modeling this for us. Um, and that really helped me. So it was like, oh, this <laughs> these people who I look up to are doing all of this. And over the course of years, it was able to like kind of like break down those resistances inside where it's like, oh, this is just my my kind of dirty texture my dirty carpet (laughs) and like let's air it out yeah (sighs) there's a lot uh, to be said about like the value of healthy community i suppose Mm -hmm. yeah well i think i've got a wrap for a phone call um and i think we did well here so thank you michelle thank you kyle um if everybody wants to check out our educational offerings psychedeliceducationcenter.com for more that would be great uh psychedelicstoday.com will get you there too tell friends about your favorite episodes and uh Yeah, we love you. Thanks for watching or listening. This is on YouTube. You can see us in high def if you want to. (laughs) Please don't. Um, I'm just kidding. Please do. (laughs) All right, everybody. We will see you on the next episode on Tuesday. I hope you have a lovely weekend and take care. Thanks for listening. Thanks.